at last the identity of the real Antichrist finally revealed. You know, this, this topic that we're going to look at today is of vital importance to any Bible student. Uh, who, who is the Antichrist and, and where that fits into Bible prophecy is, is extremely important, especially in these last days, which we believe we're in, that soon Jesus will return to establish God's kingdom on the earth. Now, if you uh, responded to, uh, to this ad that we have here, uh, we will answer all these questions and look at all the details that are here. Um, but our, really what we want to do is, is establish a, a biblical perspective. You know, if you were to look up in a, in a dictionary, here's a modern definition of Antichrist taken from a, a typical dictionary. If you look up the word, or even if you're asked someone on the street what they think Antichrist is, you'd probably get something like, like this, um, you know, an enemy of Christ, Antichrist, that makes sense. Um, but here's probably the one that uh, that you would get most from most people uh, if they knew what Antichrist was or had some idea, you know, hearing about it in the media or, you know, talking to their friends, whatever. And this is what the, the American Heritage College Dictionary says as their second definition for Antichrist. The great antagonist expected by the early church to cause chaos and corruption in the last days before the second coming. And we're going to see this is, is really important, um, this, this, this understanding in, in, uh, for most people. And simply a third definition is, is a false Christ. And, and what we see here from this definition, particularly number two, is that most people, Christian or non-Christian, if you were to ask them about Antichrist, they would expect Antichrist to be you know, a singular sort of diabolical leader. Uh, and, and he's going to try and take over the world, as it says here, causing chaos. Uh, and it's going to be sometime in the future. You know, it's, it's in the last days just before Christ's second coming that, that he'll be manifested. And, and so we don't necessarily expect him to see him now. Maybe we do. But, you know, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, 1,000 years ago, um, he didn't exist uh, by most people's definition. So uh, most people are waiting and looking around and saying, you know, who, who is this? Who is this individual? Who is this person that is going to oppose um, mm -hmm. Jesus? Well, what we'd like to do is instead of looking at a biblical, uh, sorry, a, a, a dictionary definition, we want to look at a biblical definition. And it's interesting if I were to ask you, you know, where does the word Antichrist appear in the Bible? Um, you know, if we had a, an open session here brainstorming, I'm sure we'd hear things like, oh, the book of Revelation or, you know, Ezekiel or, or, or Daniel, some of the Old Testament prophets. Uh, this is where the word must appear. And interestingly enough, the word only appears in one book of the Bible, and that is, that is the epistles of John. And what we're going to do is look at every single one of them uh, one by one. The very first place you would find it, if you looked in a, in a concordance and you found the word Antichrist, would be here in 1 John chapter 2, verse 18. Now, I'll take this opportunity to uh, suggest that you do have your Bible and get it open. Um, if you don't, that's fine. This, the verses will be on the screen. Um, also, these, these slides will be available uh, if, if you're interested. Uh, we'll have handouts of them and, and lots of notes as well. So if you're interested in following this up, uh, just contact us and we'll, we'll make sure you get a copy of, of all these things. Um, and if you're watching this later uh, on uh, as a video, you can you can stop stop it and, and at any time. But here, this is the first place the word appears in our Bible. It's First John chapter two, verse eighteen. So way at the end of the New Testament, and and this is what it says. This is the apostle, the apostle, disciple John writing, and he says, "Little children, it is the last time. And as you have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now there are many Antichrists." whereby we know that is it is the last time. And it's interesting, this last time uh, idea. You know, in the first century, there was a sense in which it was the last time because uh, Jesus had come and, and the, the time of, of the uh, the nation of the Jews was coming to an end in, in AD 70. Um, and so there was a lot of expectation about that. And then you sort of flash forward 2,000 years in our time, uh, and, and we feel it is the last time for Christ's second coming. And so there's this expectation. But what do we learn from this passage about Antichrist? Well, there's a couple of things that, that we can do. First of all, we can look at this word uh, in, in Greek. The, um, the New Testament was written in the Greek language, and Antichrist is actually uh, a Greek word. Anti has the idea of opposition to or in place of, and I think we can we understand that, you know, an anticlimax, um, antifreeze. We, ha we have this word anti in our, in our vocabulary in English. Um, and Christ is also a Greek word. It just means the anointed one or the Messiah. So basically, it means what it says, someone who opposes Christ or someone who stands in the place of Christ. All right, so Antichrist shall come. But then he goes on to say, even now, there are many, many Antichrists. So what does that mean? Well, look at how this single verse in the New Testament, the only verse we've looked at so far, flies in the face of the, the modern definition or the typical understanding of Antichrist. Because look, it says here, Antichrist is not just future. You know, he shall come, that's true, but he's not just future because even now 
there are many antichrists. And and Paul and uh, John here is writing in the new in the in the first century. The New Testament was completed before the end of the first century. So there's a sense in which it's not just future. Oh, it will be future, but it's not just future. And notice here, um, John says there are many antichrists. So it's not just a singular individual, uh, but it, it can be plural. And so our common understanding of antichrist, our dictionary definition of, of antichrist, is, is kind of challenged by this very first verse that we've looked at in the New Testament. And we're going to build on this and move through all the passages. But hopefully that kind of captures your attention and say, oh, maybe I didn't know as much about this as I thought. Maybe what I've heard uh, in, in the media or, or from other people isn't exactly accurate because the Bible speaks of an antichrist that has existed since the first century and is not just a singular individual, but in some, in some senses spans this period of time, the last 2,000 years. Now, we looked at this verse um, in 1 John 2, verse 18, where the word antichrist and antichrists appears. The next one is in 1 John chapter 2, just a few verses later, later, verse 22. It says, who is a liar, but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ. He is antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. And then in 1 John chapter 4, a couple chapters later, we'll just read the first three verses. It says, beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God, and is that spirit of antichrist where have you heard that it should come, and even now already is in the world. And in the last place, the word Antichrist appears in our Bible, is in 2 John, his second epistle in verse 7, for many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an Antichrist. Now, friends, these are the only four verses in the Bible where the word Antichrist appears. It appears only five times, uh, four as singular, one as plural. And so it's a great study to do. Uh, if we say, you know, what is a biblical definition of Antichrist, we can look at every single one of these verses, and that's what we hope to do in this presentation. Now, of course, from there, once we've established this these list of clues, we can go off to uh, back to Daniel or or forward to Revelation and the the, the the Olivet Prophecy that Jesus taught and see how they're all connected. So, yes, the concept of Antichrist is really from Genesis to Revelation, uh, but the word itself only appears in these four verses, and so that's where we'll start. And we're going to assemble a list of clues from these verses and then see how that might expand to the rest of Scripture, which we won't have time to look at in detail, but we will cover uh, today. And so what have we discovered so far from just this very first verse, 1 John 2, verse 18? Well, uh, we've provided a handout for those of you that are here in person, and you can start filling in that handout. Uh, if you're watching online, be sure to download, download the worksheet and you can fill this in as we go along. So clue number one comes from the definition. What is Antichrist? Well, it's one who sets himself as an opponent to Christ, anti-Christ, or a substitute or a replacement for Christ, and, and most likely both. There's a sense in which someone who opposes Christ wants to usurp him or to take his place. And this word anti covers both of those ideas, anti-Christ. Um, John had said to them, you have heard. So this wasn't a new message. It had never been called anti-Christ before. It came under other names in other places in Scripture. Jesus calls them false Christ. And, and so uh, they had heard about this. It was a topic of discussion among the first century. Um, and uh, for example, Matthew 24, verse 24, is where Jesus speaks of false Christ, the Christ that shall arise and come to deceive many. So the first century church had heard about this and they were concerned. And, and so John is writing to them uh, to tell them about this topic, even now. So Antichrist existed in the first century. And we can look at a couple of other passages. They're here on the screen. We won't go to them now. Um, but in Acts 20, Paul says that from amongst the elders in, in uh, Ephesus, false Christ would arise. And uh, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 is a passage that speaks of this topic, calling Antichrist the man of sin. And so already we have three clues, and we have one more here, that it's plural, Antichrists. There are many Antichrists. So Antichrist can be plural, not just singular. It could. This is a couple of ways. It could represent a, successive, a succession of individuals, so that there's singular in, uh, Antichrists, at any given time, but when you group them together, they're a group, or it could be plural currently. You know, it could be a system or a group of people representing this idea or this concept that is that is against Christ. And so just from this very first uh, clue, friends, we've, uh, th this very first verse, friends, we've been able to establish four clues that really fly in the face of our, our, our common understanding of people uh, in, a, in a dictionary definition kind of way, or that we see in the media. We'll come to that a little bit later. Well, what we hope to do then is look at all four passages in John that refer to Antichrist, and we're going to get about 10 clues or so in our first chart. 
and uh, that will take quite a bit of our time. Then we'll contrast that to what the popular Christian view is, and we'll see which one holds water. So here's our worksheet. Um, this is now um, 1 John chapter 2, verse 19, and it says, They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out. And who's the they? Well, we'll come to that. That they might be made manifest that they were not of us. So who are the they? Those of the Antichrist. Because 1 John 2, verse 18, the previous verse, and hopefully you can see that if you have your Bible open, um, it says there are many Antichrists that have gone out. And he says they actually went out from us. Well, who's the us of verse 19? Who, what does he mean? They, Antichrist, went out from us. Well, these were the true believers. This was the church of the first century. This was the beloved that John um, wrote to, the little children that he wrote to in his epistles, the believers. And so those of the Antichrist were actually part of the early church, and they had left the church and went out um, because their, their doctrine was inconsistent with the truth. Now, this is quite different than, than the common idea. Some people will say, oh, Antichrist is going to be some sort of government official, or Antichrist is going to be some political leader, um, or some you know wealthy merchant or something. There's all kinds of ideas out there. Well, whatever Antichrist is, we have to understand this context, that they used to be part of the early church. And in fact, we mentioned this, Acts chapter 20, Paul told the elders at Ephesus uh, that they were going to uh, arise. He says, from, uh, from among your own selves will men arise, speaking perverse things, seeking to draw men away from the truth. He calls them wolves, grievous wolves that would enter the flock. And, and so Antichrist is associated with a system uh, that came out. They once held the truth, but now they are against those teachings of Christ, some very important fundamental teachings. And so our clue number five, you can put your own words in there. This is what I have. From whom or what did this Antichrist system originate? Something along the lines of uh, this anti the Antichrists, the plural, the, this, this group, were individuals who left the first century church, including some who were fathers or elders and leaders in the church. And uh, this should be astounding to you, I hope, because it's very different than, than perhaps what you thought before. And all we're doing is reading scripture and trying to pull out these clues with respect to Antichrist. The next place where, uh, just continuing to read on here in 1 John chapter 2, we're now in verse 21. It says, I have not written unto you because you know not the truth, but because you know it, and that no lie is of the truth. Truth and lies are obviously incompatible. They're mutually exclusive. And then he says, who is a liar, but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ. He is an Antichrist that denies the Father and the Son. And so now we are getting another clue. What? How are we going to identify this Antichrist system or this person? What is, it, what is it associated with? Well, look at the words here. Lies, falsehood, deceit, denial. And, and there's an intention here. You know, they're, they're, they're intentionally going against what they knew to be true. That's why they had to leave the first century church because their teachings were no longer compatible with the truth. And what is it that they're lying about? What is it they're denying? It's something about that Jesus is the Christ and, and ultimately denying, therefore, the true relationship between the Father and the Son. In denying Jesus, in, in denying that Jesus is the Christ, in being anti-Christ, they've, they've turned against God. They've become anti-God. And, and that's how this system can, can stretch back, really, to the beginning of time. We know that God and his ways have always been opposed um, by men who, who choose to deny him. And in this case, they're denying the Father and the Son. Well, we'll have to tuck that away for now. What, what could it be? Could it, could it be just saying, well, we don't know. They never existed. We'll see what they actually taught. We now go to 1 John chapter 4, and you'll recall that in verse 3, Antichrist appeared, uh, the word. Um, but let's just get a little background to that. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, he says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try or put to the test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. So this idea of falsehood and, and false teaching, false Christs, um, is expanded upon here. But what does it mean, believe not every spirit? What's a spirit? Well, this word here in Greek, once again, and you can check this out, it literally, it literally means a breath. It's, it's the Greek word pneuma. It's a breath. It's speech. It's teaching. It's doctrine. So don't believe everything you hear. Uh, that's what John is encouraging us in his epistle here. He's saying, don't believe everything you're taught. And I think that's good advice. And he says, you know, you gotta, you got to put things to the test here. Um, so, for example, this idea here is referred to... Um, by Paul in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 4, he says, For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, Paul says, if you're hearing some stuff about Jesus that doesn't didn't come from us, it doesn't align with what the what Jesus himself taught and with what the apostles taught, 
Um, or if you receive another spirit, another doctrine, another another speech, which we have, which you have not received, or another gospel, which you have not accepted. So look at what he's saying here. There's going to arise teachings, doctrines that are anti-Christ. They're against Christ. They're denying Christ. It's different from what the apostles taught. Um, it's, a, it's, in fact, another gospel. And we know another gospel cannot save. So what does it mean here to try the spirits? I mentioned it means to, I said it, it means to put to the test. Um, check them out, examine them, discern them, prove, see, see if see if they're actually right, okay? And so the spirits are linked to the false prophets, this teaching, this speech, okay? So really, we wanted to sort of put this in, in, in language that's maybe more familiar to us. John's saying, beloved, don't believe everything you hear, everything you're taught, all the doctrines you hear, but put them to the test to see whether they are consistent with the teaching of Scripture, the teaching of the apostles, the, the teaching of Jesus, the teachings of God. He says, because many false prophets are gone into the world. And once again, our clue number eight here is that this antichrist movement, we might want to call it, it started in the first century and it exists today. It's going to be large. It's going to be popular. There's many of them. It becomes, it becomes the most common teaching. In fact, it would seem many false prophets are gone into the world. They've infiltrated all over the world. So reading on. He gives now um, a test. And this is brilliant. You know, he doesn't leave us hanging. John says, do you want to know what spirit is of God and, and what spirit isn't? He says, every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. Oh, okay, this is good. We can check, you know, do you believe that Jesus came in the flesh? If they say no, they're not from God. If they say yes, they're from God. Ah, that's a, that's a pretty easy way to test a doctrine. But what does it actually mean? What's this idea of confessing? Well, it's a pretty strong word. It means to assent or to covenant or to acknowledge or to promise. Um, it's talking about a firm belief. It's, it's not like being wishy-washy. We might call it like an important doctrine. So this is obviously very important because it distinguishes between truth and error, between the true teaching of Christ and the teaching of Antichrist. So what is it saying? We have to confess or aff affirm, believe that Jesus came in the flesh. Well, does that mean that he just existed historically, that he was a, a real person that, you know, is that what it's saying? He, he had, he had like, you could poke him. Well, it means more than that. It, it means all those things, but it means a little bit more. I mean, you do a little bit of digging. So this, uh, this word flesh, you could look it up in the Greek. This is the Strong's number. If you're not familiar with how Strong's numbers work, uh, you can look up the Greek uh, word and it's associated with a number. So it's easier for us non-Greek speakers. And I'm not a Greek scholar. Uh, but I've used, I can use, you can use the resources that are available to check it out. And this is what it says. This word flesh literally means human nature with its frailties, physically or morally, and passions. So it's not just the fact that, that you could poke Jesus or you could see his name written in a, in a history book, but that he had our nature, that Jesus came like us. That's really what it's saying. And this is consistent with the rest of scripture. And we're going to just digress a little bit here because this is the most important thing. You have to understand that uh, John has said, you have to put doctrines to the test. You have to check them out. And this is the one that's the most important one. Did Jesus come in the flesh? The truth says yes. Antichrist says no. So what does it mean about this flesh? Let's just, just figure this out. Um, look how this idea is, is used here in these passages. Uh, Romans in 7 and 8, you could, read, you could read them right through. I would suggest you do that if, if this is new to you or if this is intriguing. Um, just check this out. So this is what it says in, in Romans 7 verse 5. When we were in the flesh, the motions of sin did work to bring forth fruit unto death. So th that that what's inside us that compels us to, 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 to chafe against God and to go against the things we know to be right, which Paul says in Romans 7, you know, I, I want to do the right thing and I fail to do it. I, I want to resist the evil, but I end up doing it. That's, that's our flesh. You know, he, he goes on to say in verse 18, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwells no good thing. So you can see then that basically the word flesh is that which causes us to sin. It's, it's a proneness to sin, what we might call human nature, that, that by, that by which we are tempted. And you can see here that Jesus was sent in this form. In Romans 8, in verse 3, 5, and 6, just collapsing a few verses together here, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. So Jesus came in our nature. He had the same proneness that we do. Um he says, goes on to say, they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. And so there's this battle that goes on. You know, as we know that to do the right thing uh, and we battle against the wrong thing, Jesus had this same battle going on in, in his own mind. He says, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So basically, Jesus came with this flesh. He had a battle 
to wage just like we do. And it goes right back to right back to Genesis. You know, there, you've got the thinking of the serpent, you've got the thinking of the spirit, and they've been in enmity or uh, in, in antagonism ever since. And Jesus faced that. That is, he had a carnal nature or human nature. He faced the same battle we do. And this is a consistent teaching of scripture. Look at these passages. Um, it couldn't be clearer. These are probably two of the best ones. Hebrews chapter 2, uh, verse 14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, blood that's you and me, he, speaking of Jesus, he also himself likewise took part of the same. For in that he hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor or to help those that are tempted. I mean, it couldn't be any clearer, could it? Uh, Paul, in, in writing here, had to use this uh, phrase, he also himself likewise, to like bold and underline and highlight the fact that Jesus had the same nature as us. And he was tempted like as we are so that we can identify with him and go to him for help because we are tempted. This is elaborated in, in Hebrews uh, chapter 4, verse 14, speaking of Jesus, the Son of God, it says, he was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. There's the difference. There's the key. And in the language of Genesis 3, 15, although being bruised in the heel by the sting of the serpent, that is, he was tempted like us, he crushed the serpent in the head. He, he never gave in. He destroyed it in himself um, and, and never, ever sinned. And the implication then is let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain, obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So you can see the point of both these verses is Jesus came in our nature for our benefit so that we could go to him for help and that we could have an opportunity for the forgiveness of our sins. So he was tempted in all points like as we are, and yet without sin, he won the victory over sin and therefore over death. You know, the wages of sin is death and, and we're all caught in this cycle that leads only to death, the broad way that leads to destruction. But Jesus broke that cycle we can get out of that infinite loop of sin and death through Jesus because he overcame sin. Therefore, when he was crucified, God could raise him from the dead and give him eternal life, never to die again. And we can participate in that victory that Jesus won. So this is powerful. We have to understand that Jesus came in the flesh. Now, here's where we get back to the topic of Antichrist, because Antichrist doesn't teach this. So 1 John 4, verse 3, picking up this, this uh, context here that we've been looking at, Every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. This is that spirit or that teaching of Antichrist, where have you heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. So we're getting some reinforcements of some clues, some clues here. Okay. So really, really important to understand this. Jesus came in the flesh. So the truth is that Jesus had human nature like us. Antichrist teaches something that denies this doctrine, either overtly or perhaps. Uh, you know, obliquely, that some of their teaching is inconsistent with this concept that Jesus had human nature like us. And again, this is re uh, reinforced here, like it was in 1 John chapter 2, uh, that even now already is it in the world. So these false teachings, these false ideas about Antichrist were existent in the first century. Um, many of the writings in the New Testament dealt with some of these things uh, and, and uh, were instructive in the true teaching of Jesus, like we saw in Romans and in Hebrews, those had to be taught because obviously there were some who were teaching otherwise. And so Antichrist is therefore not just a future phenomenon. Now, there's 10 clues that completes that first part of that worksheet. And all we did was take a biblical look at the at every single passage where the word Antichrist appears. So hopefully you enjoyed that and you could replicate that study on your own. And there's only four verses, only five occurrences of the word. And we've got all these clues. Now, what we'd like to do is compare.